In this lecture, we'll continue our discussion of the problem of evil, the problem of why God allows pain and suffering. Last time we went over some preliminary considerations as well as a logical problem of evil. Now we'll go over the evidential problem of evil. So, the evidential problem of evil says that the existence of evil makes God's existence less likely, whereas the logical problem of evil says that God's existence and the existence of any evil at all are incompatible. So you can see that the evidential problem of evil isn't claiming anything nearly as strong as the logical problem of evil. And so that makes it maybe a, that'll make it maybe a, a stronger argument to, because they're being more conservative. William Rowe is a proponent of the evidential problem of evil. And in this lecture, I follow the conversation he had in, uh, between Michael Bergman and Daniel Howard Snyder on this problem. Here's the argument. There exist horrendous evils that an all-powerful, all-knowing, perfectly good being would have no justifying reason to permit. Two, an all-powerful, all-knowing, perfectly good being would not permit an evil unless he had a justifying reason to permit it. Therefore, God does not exist. All right, so the idea is that if God is going to allow something, he would need a justifying reason to allow it. But there are some evils that God has no reason for permitting, no justifying reason, and therefore God doesn't exist. So there's kind of a conflict between the evils we see in the world and our idea that God wouldn't allow such evils if he exists. So I'm curious to know what you think of this argument. I look forward to your comments in the comment section. What is a justifying reason? Here is what William Rowe says. God would have a justifying reason for permitting some horrendous evil if he would not be able to prevent that evil without forfeiting some good that outweighs the evil or permitting some equal or worse evil. So as an example, in the case of humans, you know, I take my daughter to go get a shot from the doctor and I'm justified in doing this because in giving her a shot, I'm, yeah, I'm causing her, I'm allowing her to go through suffering, but I'm preventing some worse evil namely her own death. So God, maybe, uh, would need to have some sort of reason like this in order to permit a case of evil. So he's forfeiting, I mean, he's uh, bringing about some greater good, or he's preventing some worse evil. So what are some horrendous evils? William Rowe gives some examples. Evil one, a fawn, let's call him Bambi, is horribly burned in a forest fire caused by lightning. Bambi lies on the forest floor suffering terribly for five days before death relieves it of its suffering. In Evil 2, a five-year-old girl is brutally beaten, raped, and strangled in Flint, Michigan on New Year's Day a few years ago. As far as I know, E2 is uh, sort of made up as well as E1. However, these sorts of things happen in our world and not infrequently. So, can you think of a reason, what justifying reason there might be for permitting E1 and E2? I can't think of anything. I can't think of a good reason why God would allow E1 or E2. And then we need to ask, does it, not just for these evils, but for every evil in history, does it seem reasonable to think that God has a justifying reason for permitting every single one of the evils in history? It's a good question. And William Rowe maybe has something going here with his argument. So let's consider some objections to the evidential problem of evil. Objection one, we can deny that God has no reason by showing the very reasons he has. So we deny that God has no justifying reason for permitting the evil around us by listing the very reasons God has for permitting evil. This would be a rejection of premise one. So we deny that God has no reason by listing the very reasons. We say, hey, I know why God allowed that evil for this reason and that reason. So when you do this, when you give a reasonable explanation rather than a merely possible explanation, like planning as free will defense we spoke about in the last video, when you're doing this, you're giving a theodicy, a reasonable explanation for why God would create a world with evil. And various theodies, theodicies have been given, as discussed in the Internet Encyclopedia of Philosophy, the soul-making theodicy, the free will theodicy, and the heavenly bliss theodicy. For the soul-making theodicy, the idea is that God doesn't want you to sort of have everything you could ever want or hope for. 
uh, you know, because that would spoil you. Uh, God wants you to be great in soul. He wants you to develop the virtues. And if he gives you everything you want or hope for, you aren't really inclined to develop the virtues. It's through suffering that you really are given the chance, the opportunity to develop the virtues. So the idea is our life here on earth is not just for our own sort of pleasure, though God does care about our happiness and uh, experiences. Our time here on earth is sort of like a testing ground for, for us to, uh, you know, develop either for the good or for the worse, right? For the better, for the worse, so develop a certain character like courage, compassion, and, and those sorts of things rather than cowardice and um, contempt. That's the soul making theodicy. God allowed evil in order to help us develop our souls. Free will theodicy is that God gave us free will and we chose to abuse it. And God is justified in giving us free will because free will is such a great good. Can you imagine a world where God created sort of robots who act towards each other in certain mechanical ways? Of, Hello, how are you? You're looking very good today. Uh, there, there wouldn't be genuine relationships in such a world, but in a free will, a world with free will, there can be genuine relationships between each other and with God. So maybe God granted free will in order to permit the opportunity for genuine relationships, even though he knew he was also uh, permitting the opportunity for people to abuse their free will. Then the heavenly bliss, the odyssey, the idea is that, hey, you know, you may suffer for some time on this earth, but if you live your life in the appropriate way, the way that God demands, then you've got heaven uh, as a reward, right? So yes, you may suffer now, but there's a certain reward coming at the end if you can just endure the suffering and, you know, follow sort of God's demands for salvation. That's objection one. We're trying to list the very reasons God has for permitting evil. With objection two, um, the idea is that Roe claims that because we don't see any reason that God would permit the evils we see around us, there is no reason. But the response is, how should we know that? How should we know that God has no reason? So in support of premise one, Roe infers that because we don't know of any reasons that would justify God's permission of certain horrendous evils, there are no justifying reasons. But as the objection goes, this inference is unreasonable. Our knowledge pales in comparison to God's knowledge. So it's not rational to think that because we can't think of a justifying reason for some evil, that God has no justifying reason for that evil. To see if Roe's inference is indeed unreasonable, let's examine his reasoning a little more closely. In support of his first premise, that God has no justifying reason for permitting the evils we see around us, Roe relies on the following unstated argument. So far as we can tell, there is no reason that would justify God in permitting the Bambi and rape cases. So it is more likely than not that there is no reason that would justify God in permitting these cases. So far as we can tell, there is no reason, therefore there is no reason. This is a no see -em argument, so-called. And, uh, you know, uh, Daniel Howard Snyder and Michael Bergman talk about this in their exchange with William Rowe. And the structure of no CM arguments is as follows. So far as we can tell, there is no X. Therefore, there is no X. Sometimes these, these inferences are reasonable. When you're looking for a carton of milk in the fridge uh, and you don't see the milk in the fridge, it's reasonable for you to say, hey, we're out of milk. When you're looking for your car in the garage, assuming you're not a hoarder, uh, and you don't see your car, well, you can reasonably infer that your car is not in the garage, unless it's a smart car, in which case it might be, you know, behind the rake or something under the water heater, who knows. But sometimes no CM inferences are not reasonable. For example, we've barely scratched the surface of the universe. We, we've investigated such a small portion of the universe. For us to say we didn't see any extraterrestrial life in the universe that we explored. Therefore, there is no life in the entire universe. Well, that seems unreasonable because it's a small area that we've looked in compared to the size of the universe, and therefore we shouldn't expect that the, the 
extraterrestrials would be in the very area that we've sort of explored and that they that we can infer that they aren't in any of the rest of the universe and then okay corn bugs in the cornfield i don't know what what sort of bugs are in cornfields uh you know i'll call them corn bugs so if you're driving by a cornfield and you look out the window you're going 65 miles an hour and you say i don't see any corn bugs in that field therefore there aren't any that's unreasonable in order to that's not the way you would go about looking for bugs in a cornfield you would have to stop your truck, you'd have to get out, you'd have to start investigating. So a no CM inference is reasonable if its premise makes its conclusion more likely than not. If it's a strong inductive argument, and you can you can go see my slides on my video on inductive arguments in the uh, playlist on critical thinking. Um, but um, yeah, you can look there for more information, but a no CM inference is reasonable if its premises make its conclusion more likely than not. But what would that be? What, what would make it a case that a no -CM premise makes its conclusion more likely than not? Here's the key. A no -CM premise makes its conclusion more likely than not, only if more likely than not we detect the item in question if it existed. Compare the first, these two examples. Would we detect the carton of milk in the fridge if it existed in the fridge? Yes. I mean, it's not, you know, under a piece of lettuce. It's a, it's, a, it's a big sort of object for the area in which we're looking. What about extraterrestrials in the universe? We shouldn't even expect that we'd see them if they're there. Why? Because we've only searched a small area and the universe is vast. So here's Rowe's no -seam assumption in his argument. More likely than not, we detect a reason that would justify God in permitting E1 and E2 if there were one. What he's saying is if if God has a reason for allowing those evils, we would know about it. But why think that? It's more reasonable to refrain from to to uh, um, refrain from affirming that assumption than it is to deny it. Sorry, it's more reasonable to refrain from affirming it than to affirm it. To affirm it would be to think that the insights attainable by finite, fallible human beings are an adequate indication of what is available in the way of reasons to an omniscient, and, omniscient and omnipotent being. We know so little compared to what God knows. Therefore, just because we can't see a reason, it doesn't mean there is no reason. So consider two analogies, a parent to child analogy. So you take your kid in to get a shot and your kid can't understand why you allowed her to go through such pain. And you can't explain it to her because she's one. And um, if she could go through this sort of process, you know, it wouldn't be very reasonable of her to do so hey, I don't see a reason why dad allowed me to go through such pain. Therefore, there is no reason. No, she should say, you know, dad is decades older than me, maybe even centuries. And uh, just because I can't see a reason why he would allow that, it doesn't mean there is no reason. In a similar way, if I go to see Stephen Hawking, although, you know, he passed away, but if I go see him lecture and I can't understand a bit of what he's saying, it's on me. I shouldn't say, I couldn't make sense of his lecture, therefore his lecture made no sense. No, I should say, I couldn't make sense of his lecture, probably I need to study up on physics, right? In the same way, just because we can't see a reason why God would allow evil, it doesn't mean there is no reason. So, here's a summary of the objections to the evidential problem of evil. In response, we can come up with the very reasons that justify allowing the evils we see around us, or we can claim that we're not in a position to know that God has no reason allowing the evils we see around us. And what do you think of these objections? I'd like to know. So here's a, my, here are my concluding thoughts on the problem of evil. The logical problem of evil comes up short. That's pretty clear. And I think personally that the evidential problem comes up short. Although it's an open debate in philosophy. If this is right, then there isn't a philosophical argument from evil that undermines God's existence. But it might still be difficult to trust God in the face of all the suffering we see. You might still ask God why. But this is the, remember, this is a psychological problem of evil, not the philosophical. We don't need a philosophical argument to address that. We need pastoral care, counseling, or deeper relationship with God.